All right, wonderful. So we have a big hour here. And it's interesting that he's saying they're looking for board people because we have a panel of outstanding board directors and executives and entrepreneurs. And we have a room full of women that are aspiring or actively on board. So uh, we may be sending you some emails, Dan, about that board opportunity a little later, if that's all right. OK? All right, good, good. OK, so I want to start off with just giving you guys a quick update on Upwork, what we've been up to. A lot has happened, I think, since we've last gathered. We had our big annual dinner in February. Who was able to come to that? Woohoo! Yeah, nice. So we had uh, about 600 uh, executive women. We had an outstanding panel of entrepreneurs all running their billion dollar unicorn companies. <laughs> And it was an amazing event. Uh, we've got a great lineup of events. And if you have been following these two boards, it talks a little bit about some of the upcoming Bay Area events. But I think you know we've got chapters all over the world. We've got 4,000 members, um, growing to 5,000 members this year. Um, and that's all been via word of mouth. Uh, we have just hired a marketing person. So we actually will be doing some outbound marketing. Um, we've already started to do a little bit of that in preparation for the annual dinner. And we're launching four more chapters, possibly five chapters this year um, in DC, in LA, in Dallas, and then in Sydney, Australia. Each year we launch a chapter in an international market as well as the domestic chapters. And then as we scale the team, we've got three full-time employees now, uh, we will add more. Because what we're finding is there's demand. I mean, there is more interest than we have capacity currently to manage the demand. I think all of us had had an epiphany moment at the same time, which is if we're going to change the demographics at the top, the only way we're going to do that is by working together. Right. And I think the, you know, the idea has been there's only one or two seats on the board, there's only one or two seats in the executive suite uh, for women. And so that created a dynamic that was one of competition rather than collaboration. And I think all of us realized that that's a model that's a no-win for us. So if we're really going to make a difference, we have to start working for each other. And, and then you reap the benefit of that. There's something to paying it forward that really makes a difference in your life personally. And I, we've gotten testimony after testimony of people that said, I met somebody at one of your events who introduced me to somebody who I ended up working with or working for. Or I, you know, I, I learned something and I put it to work when I was negotiating for my pay contract or when I was dealing with a conflict with a, a, a male colleague, for example. We've got testimony after testimony. We're actually starting to write about them in our newsletters um, and put them on our websites. We've got a whole website revamp that's coming. So it's, uh, it's exciting times for Upward, and we are delighted to continue to have you all. I see a lot of familiar faces uh, to have you all come to our events. And we have an outstanding panel today. I think you guys all saw the overview for our panel, their backgrounds. Why don't we give them a, a quick hand, and then we're going to jump into the panel just for time for Amazing group. So I'm going to have them introduce themselves, just because I think I would not do uh, it justice. So maybe just you know, your name, the current company, board experience uh, in particular, and anything else interesting that you want to share about yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Caroline Say. I'm CEO and co-founder of Compute Software. We're a very early stage uh, startup company in the enterprise SaaS space, helping companies run dynamically and autom automatically in the cloud. I actually recently left HPE to start this company. I used to run the online channel there. I sit on the boards of Rosetta Stone and TravelZoo, and also advise and sit on the boards of early stage as well as late stage companies. I'm an advisor to AdRoll. I actually just became a director nominee for Morningstar. I'm stepping off of the Travel Zoo board, so uh, I think I have enough uh, on my plate. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sikinder Singh Cassidy, and I am founder and chairman of The Board List, uh, which is an online marketplace for uh, women in tech to be nominated and then find board opportunity. Uh, I am, I guess, a serial entrepreneur and executive. I spent the majority of my career at Google running APAC and LATAM, and then two of my own companies. So I was the founder at Yodely, which went public in 2015, and, uh, and then the founder of Joyous, which is a video commerce platform where I just moved out of the CEO job into the chairman role about 60 days ago. Uh, and I sit on the boards of Ericsson and TripAdvisor. I used to be on the board of J. Crew, uh, and I have in the past sat on private boards like Stitch Fix and J. Hilburn. Awesome. Awesome. Hi, I'm Mariah. I'm the founder and CEO of Alum. 
Uh, we're a personal styling service, so feel free to try it out. <laughs> Very fun. I uh, can have your own personal stylist by text messaging. Um, I previously had my another uh, e-commerce startup that got bought, and before that, I was an executive at eBay. I sit on the board of Fossil Group, so also really hard job, super fun. Um, previously, I sat on a private board of a startup that Google bought, and I sit on the board of the Tech Museum of San Jose and advise on the board list, um, and that's me. Awesome. Wow, I feel kind of humbled to be here. Um, I'm Jennifer Tejada. Thanks so much for having me. I'm the CEO of an enterprise SaaS platform called PagerDuty. Uh, we just raised our Series C and announced it on Wednesday, so that's pretty exciting. Um, we are a platform for developers, so I'm the queen of the geeks. And I've been in enterprise software since uh, the mid-90s. So I knew Keith Kroc when he was at Ariba, and I was the early head of marketing at i2. Uh, I'm currently on the board of PagerDuty, or PagerDuty, my board, and then I'm also on the board of Puppet Software, which is a late stage uh, venture-backed software company based in Portland. Uh, and I'm also uh, run a nonprofit organization called Georgia Rocks, is based in Australia. That's a long story. Um, and I'm a mom and a wife, and I'm really happy to be here. So thanks for having me. Awesome, excellent. And I want to thank the board list because this panel, Sikinder and her colleagues, where's Leslie? I haven't Leslie, seen her. Leslie, I don't, th I think Leslie is not here. I think I'm the board list ah, representative okay. tonight. All right, well, um, thanks yes. to Sikinder Leslie, we were able to secure this outstanding panel. They're all uh, advisors or in some way participating in the board list agenda. We're going to talk a little bit more about that with Sikinder. But uh, just impressive. I mean, as I read their profiles and, and, and listened to their stories, uh, I was amazed. So we have some real talent among us. I want to start off with a show of hands of who's on a board. So 20 people out of about 130. 20, OK. And who wants to be on a board? OK, so that's the 80 people, yes. <laughs> Okay. All right, this is why you're here. That's a good decision to come tonight. <laughs> We're going to tell you how you can go about doing that. All right. Well, I did a little research, and when I go out and I do my upward pitches, I talk about uh, the, the value, the quantified value of having women on executive teams and women on boards. There has been study after study from the strategic consulting firms to the universities that have all said over and over again, you get better return on equity, you get better return on invested capital, you get better operating results, you get better profitability when women are on the executive teams. And similarly, when women are in larger number on the boards, have a tremendous impact. Some of the things that I, that I read were that it signals the company is a better company, better run, well managed company. You get a better mix of leadership skills, you widen the, the talent pool, you reflect the consumer decision maker, right? We influence decisions, we make a lot of decisions in the household, two thirds of American households are led by women, so you influence that consumer decision maker, and overall it improves governance. So there is an overwhelmingly compelling value proposition for why we should be on boards. And I think a part of the reason that we're not one is the old paradigm, which, which says, you know, you recruit from your networks and if all of the uh, directors are male, they're most likely gonna recruit other males. And that's not a slam against them, that's just natural. I have a lot more women in my network than, uh, than a man would, most likely. So I think that's natural. We're trying to break up that dynamic by uh, showing what are the, the best tips and techniques that you should use when you're trying to get on a board. And so that's why we wanted a panel of people that have worked uh, on public and private company boards to give us those insights. We're going to talk about that today. But I want to start with the board list because I think, you know, the organization, its mission is to help improve the situation. So what was your inspiration, Sukinder? I mean, why were you, why did you feel that this was important to do and what are your goals? I mean, what's a win for you? Sure. So, um, so we started the board list, I think, from uh, a couple of perspectives. I feel like, largely speaking, I've been a beneficiary of the tech industry. I feel like I moved here 18 or 19 years ago and found my tribe. And for the for a large part that I um, have flourished here and found, you know, the people I connect with and uh, and an industry that 
by and large, it's meritocratic. I continue to believe that. Conversely, uh, I think after 18 or 19 years, I think like many women and many women on this panel, I often thought it was enough if I was just successful and had impact in my operating role, that that would be enough to be a good role model and, 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 uh, and contribute. But I think about a year and a half ago, um, and maybe even two years ago now, gosh, uh, the narrative on women in tech was just exhausting. Yeah. Uh, and it was exhausting for two reasons. It was exhausting because number one, you weren't hearing from women. You were hearing from everybody else about women. And, I, and at the time, I was the CEO of Joyce. And I was like, why is nobody talking about this? And one of my venture capitalists who sits on my board, and five of his boards, uh, five of his uh, investments are, are women-led. He's like, why is nobody talking about the five of you? And he's like, somebody should write an op-ed. And I was like, you know what? You're right. I've been thinking about this for a while. It drives me crazy. I don't use my voice. I should use for my voice. So OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write an op-ed. And then I got 100 female founders to join me uh, and, and CEOs uh, in authoring that op-ed. Um, because I just felt like I'd been a beneficiary. And all this was going out in the universe. And, and I was getting frustrated with the narrative. And I suspected that every woman I knew was like me, which is like heads down, running our businesses, trying to ignore it, and at some point going like, you know what you're right. So, so, so to be to be fair, I give um, the VC in question, Kay Valdesai, who's on my board, a lot of credit because he was like complaining on an email thread to five women CEOs, and I was like, you're right. I should just do something about this because it's bothering me too. Um, so that was reason one, and then reason two was once we put out the letter, and it was representative not just my experience, but the experience of, as I said, almost 100 female founders and CEOs, from Diane Green to Mariah to others, who all contributed to that open letter. We got a lot of resonance. I mean, I think people were just like hungry for solutions. And that was part of the thesis, which is like, yeah, it's not perfect. Yeah, it sucks. But the women on this thread would tell you that there's so much more to being a, a leader in tech and an entrepreneur than being a woman. And, yeah. and at the same time, we've got to apply the same principles in tech that we use for other big problems to our own problems. So why are we not doing anything about uh, leveraging technology to solve the issue of women in tech? So that's, that was the other thing that inspired me to start it. And, um, and I guess the impetus for the board list was actually a year before that when a uh, major tier one VC had come to me to say, like, what should we do about women on women in our, you know, helping women in tech? And I said, and we were just brainstorming. And I said, you know what? I was like, everybody's talking about women in STEM. But the reality is, if you look at around the women leaders in tech, they don't all have uh, CS degrees. I don't. Mariah does. And probably Carolyn does. But we don't. It's not, you can't sort of just say this is a forward problem. I'm like, if you guys want to do something interesting, you know, you could put a woman on 100% on of Series B board and B boards and beyond. And that VC said, that's a great idea. And I was like, OK, if you end up doing anything with that, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to um, participate. And six months later, like I was finished it. fundraising for Joyce because I was fundraising around. And I came back and I said, so did you guys ever do anything with that idea? He's like, you know, we just think we're going to worry about our, own, about our own portfolio. I was like, OK. Because I said, as an industry, you should do this. Then I pitched three more VCs on the idea, all tier one. And they're like, you know what? I think we're just going to worry about our own boards. And then I just left the idea alone. I got busy. We wrote the letter. The letter went out. It had resonance. And then there was people were like, what are you going to do next? And then I just went back to that idea. It's like, screw it. They don't want to do it. I'm just going to email all the male and female CEOs I know and be like, hey, would you help us put a list together? Because we can affect 100% of companies today at the board level. We don't need to wait for a generation of girls in STEM to be our excuse for why there's not women in the leadership ranks of tech today, which is a bullshit excuse. No offense. It needs, it's one of many things that need to happen. Um, so the board list actually as an idea was a year before that. And we just, I just came right around back to it. And so how do you? get on the list, uh, how do you benefit from being on the list? What's the process for? To getting on the board list? Um, so the beer, board list is a 100% uh, peer nominated platform. And what it's really seeking to do in some ways, people call it the LinkedIn for boards, and that's probably close. But it's a highly curated uh, network of experienced male and women leaders who've served on boards nominating women for boards. And, and that's how you get on. So you can apply to the board list, but you won't show up in our results until you've been nominated by an endorsing member. And we have about 1,000 CEOs and senior executives and VCs in tech who are all endorsing members who nominate women into the board list. And we have about 2,000 nominations, about 1,600 women who've been nominated. That number goes up every day. Um, so, you, so you can apply, and we're happy to take your information. But often what we see now, of course, is a reverse dynamic in the early days. Um, we curate it, and we still continue to curate the endorsers. So sure. if you want to nominate, you have to apply. You have to show us your credentials. And we want to make sure that everybody nominating has board experience. Um, but now, of course, we see the reverse cycle, which is women are bringing their own nominators, right? So a woman wants to be on a board. And we're like, OK, if you don't see somebody you know, 
ask your CEO to nominate you. As long as they have board experience, you know, we just want them to, a nomination is really simple. So now, of course, we have a reverse virtuous cycle, which is women are very motivated to bring their endorsements. So it's nice to be able to go. And then one, one last question is, what's the result profile been? I mean, are you yeah, getting? Yeah, sure. It's, um, so we feel, uh, we feel um, excited about the early results. So we're about a year and a half old. Um, so far to date, about 250 board searches have been started in the board list. Uh, and uh, we launched officially in February of 2015. Uh, so while that number seems small, the reality is a Spencer Stewart or a Russell Reynolds will do about 300 board searches a year across the entire firm. Um, and our thesis was if you aggregate the best supply, we can stimulate demand. So the biggest difference between the board list and um, other board kind of networks that are out there is we're a technology platform and a community. Um, and we really believe the issue is not supply. The issue is demand. More private and public company boards need to be taking advantage of this tool and want to have a woman on their board. Um, and so uh, the results so far, we've got 250 board searches open. We believe we've indirectly or directly influenced 61 board placements. Um, when people turn over the entire uh, search to us, we have some really nice results. We, yeah, you know, we've placed on Shutterfly, Shutterstock. Um, uh, we have another public board we'll announce very shortly. And otherwise, we're somewhere in the process, meaning they're using the tool, we're helping them. And then, you know, CEOs often go rogue, right? They're going to, they're going to, I mean, not go rogue, they're busy, right? I mean, you are all busy when you, in my board place, it may take six months, it may take six weeks, depending on how fast uh, a CEO wants to move. Um, so we feel good about the placement rate so far awesome. because we're tracking what's happening in the funnel and our influence. Excellent. That's impressive, right? So do you know how to get to the board list? It's www.theboardlist.com. Okay, so everybody go check it out after tonight and send emails to Kendra if you have questions. I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have emails, yeah, but yeah. you can reach her, I'm sure. Yeah. All right, good. Well, I'm gonna ask questions for about another 20 minutes and then I'm gonna ask you all to ask questions, so be thinking about them. But first I want, I want Carolyn to tell us a little bit about how you got on the boards that you were on, why it was important for you to do that, and what role did you play? Yep. Sure. So it actually wasn't until about a year and a half in, I was at HPE now four years ago, that I was completely burnt out from my job, uh, that I started working with an executive coach. And he said to me something that resonated with me, which Sukinder mentioned, which is your career is not just about your day-to-day -day job. So much of your career is outside of that. And you've got to take this opportunity to think about other activities um, whether it's the cliche of networking through to sitting down with your former colleagues and spending time with them to not only just go network, um, to build a brand or identity to find out about opportunities, but also to learn from others. I literally used to think that speaking at conferences or panels was a waste of time, honestly, because I didn't think that Who's it Who's thought that before? <laughs> I, I just didn't think it contributed to my actual role inside of the company. And uh, I decided to take this executive coach's advice because you know, I was so burned out from work, I thought, okay, let me just step back and do something else. Uh, I decided to speak at a VentureBeat event, and it turned out that one of the executives in the audience saw me speak. He reached out from Rosetta Stone and said, everything you talked about resonated really well with where we're trying to go, what we're trying to do. Would you be interested in meeting my CEO? So that, to me, was a, a totally serendipitous occurrence that led me to my first board. Um, it took a couple months for that conversation. In the case of Morningstar, it's been like a one-year-long conversation for me to, to get onto that board. Um, but what I found extremely compelling about the experience is that it is in, very intellectually stimulating. It is hard when you have to deal with so much complexity around decision-making with limited information and with the fact that you have so many stakeholders, not just your shareholders, but of course the management team, employees, the other board directors, et cetera, or even activist shareholders, that's a whole other story. Um, so it's just been a tremendous experience. I'm so glad to have been a part of this, and I continue to want to do it because of that, that intellectual stimulation and the number of doors and opportunities that's open for me. It probably makes you a better entrepreneur too, right? I mean, oh, you feel, oh, yes, yeah, yes. You've got to manage your own board. Right, CEO. and this is my first time being a CEO of a company 
company. I have so much of an appreciation, just even for Meg, when we were at um, HP, or CEOs that I went through while I was at Yahoo. There's just so many different things occurring at that level um, that you don't otherwise see as an operating executive. And so I've, I've just learned so much, and, and I think there's a lot that I've learned that is definitely applicable to, to your day-to-day -day job. Awesome. I want everybody to tell their stories, because I think I don't want to hear a lot of women on board stories. And so, so can there maybe your experiences as well. How you got there, what you got out of it, would you recommend it? <laughs> uh, so how did I get on my first board? So um, uh, I think around 2008, when I was at Google, I identified that I really wanted to join a board. Uh, and I thought that that would be a way to round up my own experience, uh, like many of you in the room. I just started, obviously, just telling people I knew <laughs> uh, that I was looking for a board experience. and. Um, uh, there's a funny story I will tell about the board I didn't take and then the board I did take. Um, so I ultimately took the board of J. Crew. Um, I did it because both I had a passion area for e-commerce and fashion. Free uh, clothes, man. Free clothes. Why not? <laughs> um, and I ultimately ended up starting a company in that area, right, with Joyous. Um, but, uh, but that happened because Mickey Drexler sat on the board of Apple with Eric Schmidt and Bill Campbell, who were both uh, CEO and I coach it at Google, um, and Aileen Lee, who's a venture capitalist and a friend. Mickey called her and asked her for a recommendation. Aileen knew I was looking. Aileen referred me, and then Bill and Eric, you know, uh, were effectively kind of, you know, said good things. It um, helps. And so, uh, and so that's how I got my first board. But the board I didn't take, I think, which is uh, the funny story and an off-the-record story. Um, <laughs> We're is, off the record. Uh, Turn the video I off I identified right you know, that I wanted to join a board. And before I got the one that worked out, there were several that didn't work out. I mean, that happens, yeah. right? Where you meet people, and for whatever reason, it doesn't work. But um, a recruiter called me and said, hey, are you interested in being on the board of Playboy? <laughs> and <laughs> you've never heard this story? No. And I said, hmm. And she, and she said, you should. And by the way, I'm very close friends with the recruiter. And she said, you really should take the interview. Like. It's an interesting company. It's run by feminists. Christy Hefner has a great reputation, actually, and is a pretty amazing person. Um, so even though you don't think of it as a feminist brand, it is. Um, and um, and um, and you need and you know this might be your first board, and you need to get you know you need to get out there. You don't know what your first board's going to be. And so I said, I'll take the meeting because it's with Christy. So I want because I agree it would be great to meet her. I'm not really sure I can feel the brand fit on this. Um, <laughs> I understand that you think that maybe this is my only board opportunity, but you know I'm at Google, and you know I maybe think I I've got some brand equity, and maybe you know maybe there may, may be a better fit. Um, so my first board interview ever was uh, in uh, in uh, the hills of, of Hollywood uh, at the Playboy Mansion, <laughs> talking to Christy Hefner with flamingos walking right behind her. No joke. Like, drove up to the Playboy Mansion. They were, at that point, still filming that show, The Girls Next Door, yeah. whatever. The E! Show was still filming there. It wasn't there the day I was there. I did go back a second time and meet the whole board and have, and have dinner in the Playboy Mansion. But, um, or lunch in the Playboy Mansion. And they asked me if I wanted to keep the menu because it had the little bunny ears. I was like, no, thank you. Um, it was a great conversation with Christy. We're friends. It didn't work out um, because I didn't think it was the right brand fit. But uh, flamingos were definitely part of my first board story. <laughs> That is a classic. Dude, am I supposed to go after that? <laughs> Good luck. God. Um, <laughs> um, so I actually did a private board before a public. And I think that's actually just frankly easier to get. The way I did a private board, which I think is, um, you know, I went to Stanford Computer Science. And, you know, one of my former classmates was starting something. And we spent time brainstorming together. And I became an advisor. And then over time, the advisory, he asked me to be his independent. Um, and, and I think that's, a, that's, that's actually in some ways easier than the public board one and very worthwhile. And I'm, thank you, Google, for buying them. That was nice. Um, <laughs> um, so then how I got my first public board, actually, I think I might be the first person placed by the board list. Close. Pretty close. So, um, you know, to Sekinder's point that in tech, you know, there are lots of stories about all these issues. But I would actually say the tribe of women supporting women is very high. So my first board placement came because of Kinder, actually, who's one of my dear friends. So she got called about the fossil board and had just taken Erickson. And she recommended me. And you know what's interesting about that is um, I had this joke about boards. I told this to two friends when I was waiting, which is 
public boards sort of seemed to me like seventh grade. Like in seventh grade, I woke up one day and I realized like if you had a boyfriend, you could have another boyfriend. But if you didn't like have a boyfriend, like it wasn't clear how you could get a boyfriend. Like it wasn't like obvious, like you weren't dateable, I don't know. Um, so Sikander actually, and I had had a few people talk to me and lots of, you know, there's lots of passes along the way. And you know, Fossil like, you know, Fossil's like a $3 billion um, apparel accessory company and like, I'm definitely not fancy enough to be on Fossil's board. I'm like, okay. Like, they would have probably never found me if Sikender hadn't recommended me. And that is the thesis of the board list. Mm -hmm. There are these hidden gems tucked away that aren't obvious. And there's this network of people who are classically referring. So, so anyway, so they interviewed me. Um, and it, like Caroline, I would say it was a long process. So don't, um, it isn't like hiring for a job where you've, you do a few interviews, they check some references, um, and you work, right? I mean, it was a process of a lot of dating where we met, I really hit it off with the CEO. Fit is a really big issue and how much you want to work with them is a really big issue. And then they actually gave me what I would call like, I mean, they, would, they didn't call it freelance projects, but like I did quite a lot of work warming up to it, like just to be clear. Like I reviewed products, we did M&A, my first board meeting, and like I spent a lot of time like reviewing the people we were m and giving feedback. Um, but what's funny, just like seventh grade, now I get a lot of calls. Yeah, <laughs> yeah cause I've been dating, I don't know. Um, so we, we're going to how rewarding it is, but it is exceptionally rewarding. So, but I will stop. Did not go to Playboy. That's awesome. <laughs> Gotta have a boyfriend to get a boyfriend. Um, so my first board experience was in uh, 2000. So I've been at this a while. I think uh, Puppet is my eighth board. Um, I sort of specialize in private boards, and in particular, uh, I spend a lot of time on founder and executive transitions because I myself, as an operator, have been involved in four founder transitions as well. And in fact, I transitioned with the founder of PagerDuty, who's now a member of my executive team. Uh, and so it started with a, a friend who was talking about a potential acquisition investor that was looking at acquiring a business that made diapers. And uh, you might ask, like, why does a 30-year-old person who doesn't have a child have anything to say about a diaper company? But I had been a brand manager at Pampers when I was at Procter & Gamble, so I actually forgot more about diapers than most people will ever need to know. <laughs> Uh, if your basement ever floods and you happen to have cases of diapers down there, that gel absorbency can come in really handy. Save the carpet. Uh, and so, so somebody called me and, to your point, asked for help. Like, we're looking at potentially acquiring a business. We, we need some help diligencing it. Can, can you have a look at it? Can you tell us a little bit about the technology, et cetera? And sort of one thing led to another. And my first real interview on that particular uh, board was in a nappy factory in the middle of nowhere, Australia. And I remember thinking like, this is not how I pictured all the glamor of being a board member was, <laughs> was gonna be if my safety goggles and my hard hat and the diapers squirting out the, <laughs> you know, the conveyor. And, but one of the things that you learn very quickly in the process is that a, a board role is a long-term commitment. So that fit, that match, um, not getting shiny object syndrome and really making sure that like you're ready to commit your time, your efforts, um, you, the, you know, you're gonna spend time with these board members for a long time and these CEOs, et cetera, and yet at the same time, you might be put in a position where you have to fire that CEO or you have to replace that CEO. So you think really hard. Sometimes we think I just want the boyfriend so bad. Don't take just any boyfriend. Like, be really thoughtful. And I joined that particular board because the chairman was this amazing investor that I wanted to learn from. And I thought, well, I've got something I can bring to the table, and he has something he's going to bring for me, and, you know, together we'll, we'll make all this work. That business ended up being acquired while I was in labor in the delivery room. I signed 122 pages, and the lawyer kept saying, are you still, you still compass mentis? Like, you still... Still kind of like, I th think so, just a minute, ah, you know, and then sign, <laughs> right? And so the other thing is things, things in these companies happen at really inconvenient times. Yes. So make sure, <laughs> make sure that you have the capacity to take on that commitment because it's not just about reading the pack and going to four meetings a year. There is real heavy lifting to do. There are hard decisions to make. 
you, you know, your, sometimes your ethics are challenged, sometimes you have to come up to speed on something that is not necessarily first nature to you. And so, again, like be, be, ch be choiceful, be choosy. And so, you know, eight boards later, I'm still choosing the people and also trying to make sure, like in the case of Puppet, that I bring unique value to that board. What is it about me that made me a good, you know, lead independent director? What is it about me that is uniquely useful to that management team, to, to those other directors, to that company? Because otherwise, you'll find yourself having a hard time staying engaged, I think. And also, um, not, not resenting the trade-off because the time commitment does go on. Yeah, and I want to talk a little bit about that because this, it's not trivial. I think everybody has said, you know, one, you're a fiduciary. Um, if it's a publicly traded board, you could be sued. Um, you've got, you know, committees that you serve on. It ends up being a lot, a lot of time. And so the, the, the points about fit, the points about it being something you're passionate about, really interested in, so the engagement level is high, uh, the, the points about knowing what you're getting into, have a real reason for why you want to be on the board, do your research, right? Find the right companies that fit you and then start telling people. I think that's something that is really important. We tend to not tell people that we have an interest in being on boards. The more people you tell them, the more likely you're going to get on a board. So I want the panel to talk a little bit about the hard knocks, you know, a difficult situation that you had to deal with on a board and, and how you managed it. And then I'm going to open it up to questions from you all. So be Please, ready. Lisa, before we do that, can I make one point, though? I think that one misnomer, and this is, I think, super important, one misnomer is that a private company board is as big a commitment as a public company board. And I think one of the real benefits of joining a private company board is you can say, I'm gonna, I'd like to do this for two years. And quite frankly, a private company in many ways in tech is where the action is at. So I just want to lobby pretty hard. I think people think that a board doesn't count if, if it's not public, which is, again, I mean, that's ridiculous. You know, all of us have served on private and public and nonprofit boards. And, kind of doesn't matter to some degree, right? It's about adding value, having an impact. And I'd say private company boards actually offer you in some ways less of the paperwork and more of the substance that is the fun stuff of a board. You know, private companies also demand a lot more energy of a different type because they'll take as much help as you can get, right, as they can get. But you are actually dealing with strategy. You are dealing with business model. You are actually... You can find one locally. You can say, I'm only going to do this for two years. I mean, there's so much to be said about the flexibility of a private company board. So I just want to. I like that. that. And I want to just expound on that. So, should they have a strategy about what kind of board that they should go on first, right? I mean, nonprofits, academic boards, private companies, public company boards. Is there a recommended path for doing that? And are, are there recommended tools, depending upon the type of board, that you should access? to achieve it, right? It's, it's different if you want to be on a public company versus if you want to be on an academic board. Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, I think the thing I would say about academic boards and affiliate boards is largely you'll find that your board opportunity comes from the areas that you're passionate and invested. So you'll get asked, I mean, as an, I mean, we didn't talk about it, but I, I served on the alumni board of my school. I served on a board in East Palo Alto for seven years that was all job training, which is all um, vocational training. And those boards were because I, I, and then somebody I knew had an affinity and drew me into the organization. So by the time you make the board commitment, that's kind of nice because they know you and you know them. So I'd say the benefit of nonprofits is, you know, those things are largely never cold. They're almost, you're involved with the organization somehow. And by the way, that is a great path to board service. And I'd say with private boards, I'd, I look to Mariah's point, private boards are largely in your network as well. I mean, because, it, or, I mean, a tool like the board list, quite frankly, is one of the few tools that actually focuses on private boards as much as public, because there's not a lot of structure around private boards. You want to come? Oh, just on private boards, I think you have to pay it for it a lot, is what I would say. Like, you get invited, you advise, you help, mm -hmm. and then you get invited. It's, it's, they get to know you, then they mm -hmm. tend to invite you. And it's, it also depends on the stage. So like a late stage private board looks a lot more like a public, public company yeah, exercise right. because you know you're going to be in the process of filing, you know, the yeah. governance. So I chair a comp committee, you know, like we, you, you asked about the challenges that come. I was six weeks into my new role at PagerDuty up to my eyeballs when uh, we made a decision as a board to transition the founder and CEO of 
puppet. And so I basically pulled night shifts for about six days to support the process of communication transition. Being chair of comp, I negotiated both transition agreements for both executives as well as you know, working through all the equity issues associated with it, board structure as a result of the change. So I did not really have time for that <laughs> at that point in time. And unfortunately, like I said earlier, these things don't always happen at the same time. So, so I think the important thing is just like that board is going to diligence you and do reference checks and understand what you bring. You need to do the same level of diligence on that company. You know, what's coming? What, what, what are you looking for in the future? Where do you think that company is going to be? What's going to be required from the board? How much time is going to be required? Because to your point, private boards can be indentured servitude. Like they will just, yeah, yeah. They'll take they, as much yeah. as you can get. It's, and, and, and a lot of them are not paid. I mean, many of them are paid these days and some, many of them are paid in equity. So there's, you have to determine what the trade-off is for you, but it's not going to be show. And I, I find the earlier stage, the more work, the more roll hands, sleeves yeah. rolled up they're looking for versus late stage. So I only do late stage because I just don't have the capacity yeah. to take the call and be available when the founder needs you all the time in early stage as opposed to late stage. But you really have to do the diligence and understand what that company needs. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. If you have the opportunity to be a bit choosy, you know, please, please do that. I actually didn't feel like um, I was in that position when the Rosetta Stone board came about. I really jumped at that opportunity. And what I walked into was, uh, and this is all public information, a shareholder activist situation, literally that started a week after I joined the board. Uh, I had received the longest emails I've ever received in my life with the most vulgar language I've ever seen over email. Um, and, and a 70-year-old gentleman on the board, Pat Gross, who sits on the board of Capital One, he said to me, Caroline, you've seen far more than I have just in this short period of time in, in my whole corporate board tenure. Um, and literally, that was the start of my board experience. We had meetings probably once every two to three weeks um, just as a board to deal with all of the commentary, all of the feedback and input from the activist shareholders. And it ranged from, you know, you've got to kick out the CEO to you've got to replace another board member, you know, a board that I just joined among these peers and, and people were getting pointed out, um, to you've got to think about building a loyalty badge and program inside of your mobile app. I mean, that's how detailed it got. Uh, so it was thinking as a board how we would actually respond to the comments, who was really lead or on point for this. Was it the CEO, the lead director? Uh, and how did we want to channel that input? And how did we want to respond to it? Uh, one of the things that came out of it uh, that I found was a little bit interesting for me, I had this idea that corporate or public company boards didn't necessarily require um, so much engagement, involvement, and maybe this is, maybe there are differences, right, between small cap, mid cap, uh, large cap companies, so that's obviously something to think about. Um, in the case of Rosetta Stone, a small cap company, uh, the CEO and the board was actually looking for me as a current operating person, right, executive, to go in and spend quite a bit of time with the management team. So we ended up setting up a business advisory committee for me just to be able to spend time with the management team and CEO on very specific topics around product, sales, and marketing for the company. Um, so there was a lot of work involved, and, and you'd be surprised. It's, a, it's oftentimes not in your control. So that's something you absolutely do have to think about. Because it sounds a little scary. And it, I mean, just to take a second, like, this is why I'd go back to first principles. Like, I spend quite a lot of time with our executives. I spend a lot of time with the marketing team. I don't know why they ask me about merchandising. I don't think I have anything to add there. But I spend a lot of time with marketing. I spend a lot of time with the technology team. And calls come up at funny, like we're doing like a blah, blah, blah. We got to go have a blah, blah. It's very complicated. But, but like the end, you better like the people and you better like their business. Because I will say like it comes up on knee deep, like barely holding on. But like when we have these <laughs> meetings and like there's been a couple of topics where we've met like twice a week for like four weeks. And, and you just better like the people and you better like the business. Because it, it could either feel like a burden or you could be excited to be doing it. Do, do you see my point? It, actually, that has happened to me. But activism, I'm not excited. We don't want to go there. <laughs> but, but it's actually been Fun is a weird word, because some yeah. of them have been hard. But if you're committed to the people, it is worth doing. It's, it's nice. Like, don't take too many of them on. But it's actually pretty enjoyable. 
I would say. What yeah. is the right number, by the way? It depends you're what you're a, doing in your life. In an executive <laughs> role, yeah. right? So everybody's a director, VP, or C-level person in the room. I would say one is probably what your CEO is comfortable with. Uh, there are crazy folks among us who take on two, myself oh, yeah. included, um, which I'm not sure my board was that excited about, but I felt like I had the capacity. But typically speaking, in a heavy-hearted operating role, it's one at a stretch, two. Right. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Questions in the audience? I saw a couple hands. How do you negotiate for uh, for a good pay if you're going to be on a, especially a public company board? I well, think well I public company board is regulated. I mean, yeah, it's set. You don't negotiate. I mean, and, yeah, public company negotiate. boards, you get told what the board fee is, and you either like, and so, I'm, but good I'll, recruiters I'll, will I'll tell you up front. a tiny bit of exception to that. I mean, for, for one of my public company boards, we have considered a situation where someone was more interested in something a little more cash heavy or stock heavy. So even though the total amount or value was the same, they were able to come in with, with that negotiation point. Yeah, that, that, that is an exception, though. I mean, I also chair the comp committee at, um, I chair the comp committee at TripAdvisor, and I'm on the comp committee at Ericsson. And in chairing the comp committee, I've been given the responsibility for now looking at director pay. So generally speaking, because it's all disclosed, it's all I mean, it's pretty. So I think what's more likely is in, a, in a public board situation, look, recruiters and other, you know, are very upfront about what the board fees are. So you, like, the very first thing you'll, in a public board process you'll ever get asked is, here's the dates of the board meeting, can you make it? And they'll send you a spec that includes how much you're getting paid. So I think on public boards, very hard to negotiate. Private companies, you should and can negotiate. And generally speaking, as a rule of thumb, as a company is making its way to going public, as a rule of thumb, the early stage boards, like if it's early stage, you're looking at a percent or a percent plus. But as it moves towards its progression being public, by the time it's going, getting ready to go public, about a quarter of a percent is what a director is kind of expected to have, is like is a very defensible amount. So you have to look at where the person, where the company's on the curve. And I've certainly negotiated my private co director comp and just been like, you want to pay me this? Like, uh, no, it's this much. But it's all equity. I mean, I think it's very rare, even for a late stage company. They, so some of the late stage are companies are now, are, are now paying directors okay. because yeah. the percentages are going down, the spread's getting more narrow as they so get ready so to go a, out. That's a newer but I think it's more often in the case where they are preparing for a public offering. Yes. And so they're bringing you on as one of their first public company directors. directors, right? And so you're doing things like helping them pick left and right type banks, and you know, yeah, you're, yeah, you're yeah. starting to actually apply the governance that will be required in the future, so it's more more transitional. That's where I'm seeing yeah. cash compensation. To your point in the public board offerings, it's like on slide three of the spec they yes. give you. Exactly Always. how much you're going to make, how many board meetings are going to be, how many committees you're going to be expected to be on, right? And, and, and in that particular role, they'll often say, like, we're actually looking for an audit chair. Like, yeah, yeah. what's your audit chair experience? Awesome. Other questions? Yes. Uh, well, public boards should have more. Um, I would say public boards have a term. It's never two years, you know. But you you definitely want to talk about going in because there's a difference between what the term is and what's happening in practice. In practice, what's happening is poor public boards are very poor about managing board turnover. Once people get on, people want to stay on, <laughs> right? Which interestingly, I don't know that any of us subscribe to. I sort of believe like. Even on a public board, there's a certain amount of time where you've, I probably exceeded my maximum value and my maximum learning. But generally speaking, on a public board, I'd say the expectation is five to seven years, regardless of what the board term is. But it's not two, because they're, making, they're expecting a much longer term commitment. Yes. I, I would tell you that um, different countries are vary. So, uh, I was on a public board in Australia, and the personal risk is much higher than it actually is here because uh, there's a limitation on DNO coverage there. Uh, and so you do have to really think about, you have to do a risk assessment of the opportunity itself. Um, and I'd also say that it's not just financial risk, it's your reputational risk, right? So I'll give you an example. Um, there was a, a construction company um, that was found to be using asbestos in its products for a long time, and then it lost in a class action um, lawsuit, and all of the directors 
uh, were not, not only had civil actions taken against them, public actions, but also were unable to be directors ever again in the country. Like they were banned from directorship, but none of that was as bad as the reputational damage. Uh, because conversations that probably that board didn't realize at the time uh, were really important decisions relative to health and safety for not just the company, but its customers took place, were taken lightly, were, I don't think they were well understood, they weren't well represented by the management team to the board and all of those members, uh, I would tell you their careers were severely impacted over the long term because of that particular issue. So. It's not so much just the financial risk, it's the, the personal risk to your, to your reputation. The, now that is a very like uncommon case. So uh, boards do a lot of work to educate you, to ensure, so my boards have paid for me to go to director's college to be educated, they've all paid for my insurance plans, my company has DNO insurance, et cetera. So I feel like I'm reasonably well insulated from uh, the sort of random crazy thing that could happen, but it does underscore the need for you to pay attention and really understand what your responsibilities are, what your obligations are. So not just the liabilities, but what are my obligations? Because sometimes the board meeting itself protocol in the room is not gonna cover your obligations. You're still responsible for your own obligations. So we were a little bit of a unique situation where uh, we had multiple activist shareholders and then there were some that were actually very constructive and then ones that were not at all. And it turned out that we actually added a very constructive activist shareholder to our board. So my colleague and friend David Nirenberg is now on the board of Rosetta Stone as well. Um, and he has a significant share in the company. Um, and, but he's incredibly thoughtful, just I've learned so much from him, it's been so great working with him. So we got in a situation where he um, was very constructive and responding to a little bit of his peer group, but we also had to make sure that those communications did have to funnel through one person in the company that we designated as the, kind of the sole interactor with with the shareholders, um, and that we decided was the CEO. The CEO was going to do that, and everything would funnel through the CEO. Um, so we did essentially have to put like a process in place on how we were going to respond to communications. We did even form like subcommittees, just very ad hoc sub subcommittees to address very specific issues. Um, so, so that's what we ended up doing. First of all, typically there are none, and I would just, uh, I actually am not sure, so I'm not quite as sure as it's a problem. So, so, um, so first of all, at the board list, we offer training on how to get on your first board and what boards look like, and so we do do board education, what are your superpowers, so, so that we offer that to our community, and certainly um, as we have events, we kind of amplify them on social if you'd like to check them out. But, um, so we're offering something in the market, but I would just observe Generally speaking, if you think you're qualified, you know, you're likely qualified, oh, yeah. which is the opposite of what we see with men. And, um, <laughs> and most of the training, like anything, is, is on the job, yeah. right? And you kind of turn to the, more, the person who either recruited you to the board is often acting as your mentor, right? Or you look to a more experienced board member with whom you, fear, you have a relationship and you sort of ask your dumb questions, right? But, um, but honestly, and then I would say a good number of companies, if they're good and usually later stage, they will then arrange for you to have, and certainly public company boards, is, you will come in and do a day with the management team. And so, so the more structured boards and the smarter CEOs, even early stage or mid-stage, will, will give you a structured day to learn the business. But if not, you can ask for that too. I mean, and public boards do it for sure. And, and I think, you know, we've talked a lot about some of the trickiness of boards. We haven't talked very much about what's really pretty cool about it. I mean, you know, it's funny, um, you know, I sat on a private board that was a startup and I learned a ton by watching how the VCs asked questions, what they pushed on, what they cared about. So, I mean, it was just, you learn a lot by osmosis. And then the public board I sit on has like a director, a lead director, who I'm never sure I will ever be as wise as he was. Like he was lead director of Macy's our entire childhood, just to put it in perspective. And, and 
and like he's just so wise. Like just watching how he listens, how he puts it together succinctly. It's with humor, but it's kind of pushing the issue. How he leads the meetings when we leave the management team. Like, like I just like it's not that there are a lot of fiduciary responsive public boards that which helps to take the classes and there's a lot of stuff. Don't get me wrong, but um, the watching the people around you is probably you will learn. So so much doing that. And you also build a fan club. So <laughs> I would say that you know, one of the reasons I, I sit on boards in addition to my operating role is it, it's a different perspective. It works a different muscle in my brain. It makes me a better executive, but it also enables me to see the world through my board member's lens. So I think I manage my board and my investors better as the result of being on the other side of that table. And back to your seventh grade analogy, it's all about choosing the company you keep, yeah. you know? And so I found that the people that I've served on boards with have become some of my best sponsors, some of my most helpful mentors, some of the people where I have deep trust, where I can call them about something and not worry for a second about confidentiality and get straight to the crux of what I need help with, and they're cheering for me. They are, you know, they're in my corner. And it's not gender specific, it's not age specific, it's not functionally specific. It's These are people that you've kind of been, you know, in battle with together for, because there's always, we've talked a lot about the trickiness, but there's also a tremendous camaraderie there. And the last thing that I would say that I appreciate as an executive who has a board is an independent or a board member that has operator empathy, you know, that, that has walked in my shoes. So, so in, in private companies, the vast majority of your board composition will often be the investor community. And they are super conflicted. They have you know, very specific agendas in terms of what they want to get out. They're very opinionated. Their pattern recognition varies. Some of them may have never run anything. <laughs> not I am a venture investor, did you know? Exactly, that? yeah. But some of them may have never run anything, and some of them may have been pros, like may have done this before multiple times. And so in any board member, whether they come from an investor perspective or they're an independent or you hire them for a specific, you know, like uh, their technical prowess or their domain expertise, one of the things you're looking for as a CEO, one of the things I'm looking for when I talk to board candidates is, do they really, one, understand the difference between their role as a board member and my role as an operator and my management team's role as an operator? Are they going to support us in getting to a collective view of what we all believe is success? But at the end of the day, when it's hard and the shit is hitting the fan on our worst day, what are they going to behave like? What is that going to look like for, for me, for my management team? That's really important. So when I'm reference checking potential board members and even investors, we just went through that fundraising round, I want to know what they're like when things are not going well. Because that, that, is, the com that is the lowest common denominator that you sort of need to try and you know, find a good fit for. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, I, I think I sorry I, I bucketed them in the same place as academia when I shouldn't have, but I think I think charitable boards are are a great way to serve and get board experience, and I think board experience is board experience. I mean, before my public board, all my experience was nonprofit, and it still counts. And more importantly, I mean, and it's a way it's a way to get board experience in in particularly in charitable, I'd come back to that point. It's like, it's about an area you're likely passionate about and you're probably already involved with that organization, right? And that's the benefit. Like, that's a great path into board service. Uh, the biggest thing you should be when you create, so it's great that you're serving on something and that's an area you're passionate about. Number one thing you can do is honestly, be a rock star at your job. Like, you just, I mean, you get board opportunities when you've reached a certain level of P&L responsibility and leadership capability. So when people are like, what do I do to prepare for board service? It's like, be a rock star, do great work for great people. Those same people are gonna bring you board opportunity yep. and hopefully tools like the board list. But, but, but essentially, right, you reap what you sow and it's all your reputation as an operator, quite frankly, that brings you board opportunity. I mean, yeah. Yeah, leadership, And, and the people you surround yourself with. Yeah. You're way more likely to get your first board opportunity by someone who lived, like probably someone more senior than you who saw you do work and thought you rocked and believed in you. 
So choose the people you're around quite well, and then do a great job. There, there is this impression, though, that uh, especially for public company boards, that you need to be a C-level executive if you're a director level oh, person. For sure. I mean, that is true. I mean, I would say for private company boards, I think the thing you should be thinking about, what is the scale of your operating experience? It's very simple. If you want to ask yourself if you should be on a board, to say, what strategic impact am I going to have in a boardroom with a CEO and at what level? And so I think when you're earlier in your career, it may be that an earlier stage board makes sense simply because the span of what you've seen I think you can expect that at a minimum, a CEO is looking for a peer. That doesn't mean a titled peer. That means somebody who has a perspective that at one level, even if you're not as senior as that person, is a peer perspective, right? So I mean, we've all worked for yeah. CEOs on boards who are far more senior than us. I mean, I you sort of board but CEOs they want, who, but, but they're looking for an expertise and tangent. Yeah. Well, you have experience that is very, you know, that in that respect, you're the expert. I mean, so you definitely need span of control and ex expertise. And, and something really practical that I'll mention, because I get a lot of inbound. I speak, you know, we go to these events, and I actually have an open seat right now where we're looking to fill it with an independent. And I get a lot of inbound from wonderful, bright, smart women who tell me why they want to be on my board, as opposed to the value they could bring to our company, like why I need them on the board, right? And so. Being really thoughtful about your contribution, I think you mentioned that. Being able to read a financial statement. That sounds very, but I can't tell you how many operators I see, general managers, executives, that cannot read a balance sheet, a P&L, a cash flow statement that don't understand the dynamics of how revenue moves through a business or how operating expense moves through a business. You, from a governance perspective, you need to understand that. And you mentioned spending a day. I spent a day in a director's consortium myself refreshing on that, and it's made me a better CEO as well. So there are also some bare minimum skills that I think you need to be able to demonstrate or at a minimum articulate. Right. Yeah, but, but most of them we would agree have been developed in your operating roles. Absolutely. Like it's not that like to become a board director, you have to go somewhere else to the, get the experience you need. <laughs> yeah. All the experience you need to become a great director is in the, is yeah. whatever leadership role you are building yeah. and whatever expertise you bring to the table. I mean, it's something specific. Like my first private startup board was because they wanted help on product. And I'd spent my whole career doing product. And so it wasn't like I sat above, like I helped them with product, like, you know, and like my fashion board wanted help on tech and digital marketing. Like there's, so it's not that I was as senior as they were. I just offered some unique skill that they value that I was willing to work hard to share with them, if that makes sense. I think that's great. And one thing that I would encourage you, as, as you're contemplating all this, you're taking all of this in, and you're trying to put together your strategy, right? What's your next step? What should I be thinking about? I mean, you've heard lots of great ideas. Research, know who you are, your skills, find the right opportunity that fits you. The other thing is, on the networking uh, front, since this is a global networking organization, so we should talk a little bit about that. Talk to the people around you. I, these are all our entrepreneurs. A lot of you are entrepreneurs. I'm a venture investor. There's some venture investors in the room. We are always looking for uh, quality people to be on our boards. I've, I've been on 50, 60, maybe more boards. I've been a venture capitalist for almost 18 years. And so I've been on eight boards at one time. <laughs> I don't advise that. I think that's a <laughs> foolish thing to do. But I've, I've always only done private company boards just because I, I've, I've been approached about public company boards, but I don't have the bandwidth, and I just didn't think it was worth my time because I'm really pouring into my companies. I don't get paid, but I've got investments in those companies, right? I want them to be successful. But if you know venture capitalists or you know other entrepreneurs, we are always looking for quality candidates. So ask. Ask them, are there opportunities? Ask, you know, is there a way that I could meet some of the directors, meet some of the executive team. Get to know the people, make an effort uh, to reach out because you're gonna learn a lot in that process. You're gonna expose your interest in being a director and you may get an opportunity in the process. Lisa, can I add one thing actually? Um, one thing we haven't talked about is, uh, especially for your first board, I don't know if this resonates with the rest of the, pan the, the panel, but one thing I found to be incredibly important is have an awesome bio. Um, oh so all of these things about your leadership being a rock star, if it doesn't come through in your bio, uh, it's, it's a problem. I've actually talked to women who tell me about their careers, just amazing careers, received their bios, read it, and gone, 
oh my gosh, this is like a whole different person. I, <laughs> you did not tell me the story you told me over the phone or when we met in person. Um, so it's really important to get that bio, that story of your life and what you can bring um, to a board or to a company. That, that's got to be done well. Um, and that's one of the first things that people look for that you're passing around as you're networking or finding out who, who may be able, be able to help you. Any final parting comments? We'll take one more question in the back. I, I wouldn't join a board where you don't feel like you can be yourself. So if that means you're expressing your femininity or your sense of humor, it's like anything else. Like choose the company you want to keep. And um, one of the ways where I see it often is I'm a nurturer and I, um, I feel like I have that CEO's back, that I'm like looking to make sure every board meeting we're not solutioning and you know deep diving for the answer. We're trying to help figure out what's the right question we should be asking. Like where might there be opportunity that you know we aren't focused on, but how can I be helpful? Like that nurturing quality I think is important, but I think it's less about can you expose your femininity? It's more can you be great at what you do and can you be yourself and can you bring your whole authentic self to that? And if you don't feel like that's the case, then that is the wrong crew of people. That, that, is, that is not a group of people you want to spend the next five, seven years with. Yeah, I mean, I would just echo that. I think that, I think at the end of the day, boards are looking for two things. They are looking for great performers and great performance and insight. They're looking for strategic insight and they're looking for culture fit. And like anything else, you're going to excel when you fit both those things and both those things fit you. So if you want to go to a boardroom wearing, uh, you know, everything you like in your closet, knock yourself out. You will have, you know, you will have found the board where that fits and that fits you. I mean, quite frankly, it's a mutual selection process. And, and no one in enterprise software cares about my shoes. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's just <laughs> not. We have a board director who They're wears so Chanel so from head to toe, and every Christmas wears this like crazy wonderful head to toe. It's hard to explain, very bright. <laughs> I want but to see this. It's, it's amazing. If you, very expensive. Um, always different, no repeats, ever. But you know, I mean, you just find the, it's, impre it's impressive. Um, I actually didn't know the shoes came in that many colors. Um, but you know, you just have to find the culture where, but we celebrate it, we're like, what is she gonna wear for the Christmas meeting? I mean, who knows, you know? But just openness, that you will find your tribe. And the tribe is even more than work, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, your work, will, I don't know, there's like, you have to really trust each other because hard stuff happens. Excellent, with that, we are going to adjourn. Give a big, big, big hand of thanks to our panel.